this is the last presentation. There are some slides that are shared with the first one, so I will skip them quickly. How many of you uh, know about cellular technologies, cellular networks? So very few people. OK. There are some slides that explain some of the details of cellular networks. I will go them very, very briefly, OK, just so you understand this. Now, even if the main title of this presentation is IPv6 in cellular networks, actually this presentation is telling you how to deploy IPv6 only in non-cellular networks. So you have a DSL uh, customer base or corporate customer base or GPON or whatever access technology or whatever kind of customer you have. This is telling you the way you should think in the future. Okay? Don't think in short or medium uh, term, just look into the future. Because even if you have today enough IPv4 addresses, that will be nothing if you don't really start to consider IPv6 in the long term. But hang on. Yeah? T-Mobile -T USA still has enough IPv4 addresses. <coughs> but they, they, they didn't hold them back from implementing IPv6 only in their cellular network. Because I don't they think they have enough addresses for all the cellular users. Well, today they have, I think, over 52 million uh, mobile devices on IPv6 only in the network. More than that, I think. Yeah. They so have double, was, double. Well, 52 million was half a year ago. I think now it's and almost 80. No problems whatsoever with millions and millions of devices. So we are, we are, we're not talking about the future, we're talking about the present. The present, yeah, yeah. but. But the, the, the question here is that for them, the present is they already have enough IPv4 addresses. So they will say, for now, I don't need that. So the, the point here is to make sure that they are not just keeping doing the normal way and don't get ready for the future. Because when you want to do it in one year, it will be late. OK? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So, clearly, I think nobody has a doubt that it's necessary to, to support IPv6. There is no way to keep going with carrier green app. There is no way. Some people will disagree with that. We can say, OK, let's set up uh, four levels of carrier green app. Yes, we can do that. But how many things we are going to break, how much it will cost the call center support to, 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 to resolve all the, the incidents, how much will cost the carrier green net boxes, the logging systems, and so on. It really don't make sense, OK? Uh, it's obvious that we have uh, an increasing number of users, devices, uh, even devices doing tethering, especially in cellular networks. But also, we are going to see more need for addresses in something that today is not so common, but it's already happening. We will find all kind of devices that run virtual machines. And that means that a single device may need multiple addresses, not just one, like today we see. Okay, So that's going to be more and more common. Uh, and of course, in the cellular technologies, all these kind of, of things like voice over LTE, IMS, uh, EOT, etc., etc. So the, the point is make sure to understand that this is not just about solving the IPv4 problem, it's about looking at the long term strategy. So, what do you think? Is dual stack the best solution? Really not. Uh, the question is you said today you have enough. IPv4 addresses. But for those that have a cellular network, are you providing today an IPv4 public address to every cellular user? No. So here is the answer. Exactly. So here is the answer. You really believe you have enough addresses, but in fact, you don't have them. But you are using some kind of carrier grain net to support that. OK? Um, if you consider the cost of the carrier rain net, the operation and management cost for that, the impact in the call center, I am talking about a possible scenario which is deploying dual stack. Okay? Performance, we will see in a couple of slides the performance, what it means. Licenses, some vendors of cellular technologies 
charts double depending on what you are providing. If you are providing IPv4 and IPv6 to a cellular phone, uh, if you have dual stacks, sometimes you can see some issues uh, at authentication level um, for two addresses. So that's going to be more and more frequent. So it's, it's a new problem that, that you are going to discover. So here are the different alternatives that we have. Uh, IPv6 and carry green app, which, which is basically a way to do dual stack. Okay, instead of using dual stack with public IPv4, dual stack with private IPv4, we can do IPv6 only, IPv6 only with NAT64, or add to that also DNS64, 464x LAT, and we can look also to other transition technologies. You have seen already this picture, okay? And also this one and this one. So I, that's why I mentioned before that some of the slides I will, I will repeat them. But the point here is IPv6 only. There are already many content providers that do IPv6 only. And you probably don't know, but Facebook don't have any more IPv4 addresses in their data centers. You knew that? I, Facebook don't have IPv4 at all. It's strange, but it's reality. And this is happening more and more in big content providers. It's not a matter, I know where you go, but it's, in this case, it's not a matter of hardware. They are solving that, which front ends. I know. Yeah, yeah. But they are actually solving that because what they have is front ends, even by simple tricks with BGP, where they announce they have internally only IPv6. And externally, they announce the IPv6 as, of course, IPv6, but also as IPv4. OK? So what happens is that an IPv6 user is going straight to the data center. But an IPv4 user is going to the translation that Facebook is doing, but also the translation of the carry Raynet, for example. There are many, many other things. And we are not talking, in the case of Facebook, we are not, not talking about an experiment. They started doing this in 2014. The person that developed this is actually a, uh, one of my friends is, is a Spanish. And he uh, got trained uh, from IPv6 uh, when I did the first training in his city about, I think it was something like 2000. 10 or 11 or something like that, OK? And thanks to that, he got the job in Facebook to do that, OK? So you cannot believe that, but there are only two people in Facebook taking care of this, only two people in all the world. They have everything so much automated. Thanks to IPv6, they, they, they have presentations explaining that. Thanks to IPv6, they have been able to automate that so much that they don't need so many human resources on this, and they invest human resources in software and many other features. Okay. And uh, if I may add, yeah. the problem for you as an ISP is not what Facebook is doing. This is now happening at Google, this is happening everywhere. Your problem is <coughs> your users. Because your users, if you ship them just over IPv4, they will have worse user experience because IPv4 needs to be translated and then sent in the IPv6 data center. If you deploy IPv6, that's the same user will go straight with IPv6 without translation, without anything, <coughs> right? So it's it's not about which protocol you use. It's about not improving the user experience, but not getting it worse. Because with IPv4, currently, Facebook is not working very well. I, I even don't know. I use IPv6 everywhere, so I couldn't care less. But for these poor people that is on IPv4 only, <laughs> I would not like to be in that space, really. Because more and more big pr uh, content providers is doing the same thing. It is very costly to run IPv6 and IPv4, so they are just getting rid of IPv4 today. I have, I have a couple of slides later on explaining the, the performance thing, so you will, you will understand it quickly. Um, Don't get me wrong, I do No, 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 no. I mean, in I am talking in general, not about you. Yeah, yeah. So, so the thing here, 
executives, I, I understand that as well. Um, so another interesting thing here is that it's not a small network. When they did this, they, they ended the deployment of IPv6 at the end of 2015. And at that time, they have more than 100 terabits per second. So it's not a small deployment. OK? So it has been really, really, really well tested. It's not like something new. So let's think for a moment if we can go and deploy IPv6 only. What happens is that we will be able to connect to Google, YouTube, Facebook, Akamai, and many other content delivery networks, which means, of course, connecting with a lot of uh, content providers indirectly. But what happens if there is a single website, which is IPv4 only? We, we cannot connect to that one. Okay. So today, IPv6 only, as, as, as a complete picture of only IPv6, is not an option. Uh, of course, users will work very well with their contents and applications, but will not have access to all those IPv4-only websites, which today there are still a lot. Okay? Let's be realistic. It's not like just a 10%. Maybe it's already 50% still not IPv4, uh, sorry, IPv6 enabled. So it's a lot that we cannot uh, sort out. And what happens if you are using your cellular phone for doing tethering and you have all devices which are IPv4 only, they will not work as well. Okay, so IPv6 only today is not a possibility. I describe it already in at 64, so I skip this slide. Uh, here, there are more details about how NAS64 works. I'm not going to stop it here. The interesting thing here you want to see, and I wanted to demonstrate this, but for, for the reasons I explained it before, we don't have the, the NAS64 working today here. But basically, NAS64 is using what we call a well-known prefix, which is 64FF9B colon colon uh, slash 96. Okay? And after the 96, you put the IPv4 address. So that makes the complete 128 bits. That's the way it works, NAS64 with DNS64. Um, there is also the possibility for a network to, instead of using this well-known prefix, use what we call an NSP, Network Specific Prefix. But most of the people is just using the well-known prefix. Um, I think this slide was already in the previous presentation, as also this, this picture. So that's, that's what we explained before, how it works NAT64. So the point here is, can we have IPv6 only with NAT64? Well, if the device, if the operating system has a built-in functionality to generate the Quate records for those IPv4 only websites, it will work. Okay? So it could work. But it will not work for the rest of the cases. And it will not work Again, if you are doing uh, tethering and you have IPv4 only devices. Okay? So this is not yet an alternative today. This is equivalent to what I explained before, that NAT64 is breaking things. Here is the case. Okay? Now, let's suppose we add to the network, instead of to the devices, the DNS64 functionality we will have this picture, OK? It's very similar, but instead of having the DNS64 functionality here, it's here in the network. It makes things a little bit better, but it's still not perfect. And if you want to see the detailed way NAT64 and DNS64 works, here you have a picture. What happens is I have here an IPv6-only device, maybe a cellular phone, I have here an IPv4 only web server, for example. And in the ISP, I have the DNS and the NAT64 functionalities. Okay, so what happens is that the IPv6 uh, device 
is going to request the quad A record for www.example.com, but that quad A record don't exist. So the DNS64 will request the A record and build a fake quad A record. This is the prefix. I just show it in the slide, OK? So now that the host believes that the destination is IPv6, what happens is that it will ask the NAT64, hey, give me transit or connection, whatever you want to call, to this box. So the NAT64 will connect that, and then it will get back with IPv4 up to the NAT64, and then with IPv6 up to the device. This is the way NAT64 is working. Again, the difficulty is if you are using literals, this gets broken. OK? So are we done with this? Not really. Literal addresses, socket IPIs that basically break as the same as with literal addresses, and IPv4-only tethered devices will not work. OK? So same slide you have seen before. And then we come to the solution, 464xLAT. Uh, let me skip these pictures. It's the same you have seen before. And when I, what, what, what I want to stress here is that this is the magic part of 464xLAT. You have the access being IPv6 only. So you can keep your core network with dual stack because you still have customers that require regular IPv4 service. But you can get rid of IPv4 in all your access networks. OK? What that means? All the IPv4 addresses that you are using today in that part of the network, you release them. So you can either, as Jan said before, you sell them, or you use them for new customers that require regular IPv4 service. And at the end, what customers get here is dual stack. They get dual stack as a service. They get IPv4 as a service. They don't notice that their connectivity to the ISP is IPv6 only because they are getting automatically a private IPv4 address. As today, we have in every home with a router, right? We have private addresses. The difference is the cable that goes from here to my ISP today is IPv4, and now it will be IPv6 only. No need to have dual stack. You can do this with other transition mechanisms as well, OK? We will see at the end of the presentations if that makes sense. Uh, OK, now, what are doing the cellular uh, phone vendors with this? Apple is looking for a longer term strategy. Apple has more control on his app. App Store, and what they decided is they announced it in June 2015 that new applications starting in June 2016 will mandatorily need to support IPv6. If you had a record or if you recall, uh, if you have an iPhone in June, July 2016, all the applications were updated, all. You may recall that. Oh, what happens this summer? All the applications are getting updated every day. Because Apple was telling the people, if you don't do IPv6, I get your applications out of the App Store. OK? So this is a very strict, let's say, regulation from Apple, which is good for application developers, because they were not doing that until they get enforced, OK? But it means Apple can deploy IPv6-only cellular phones. In addition to that, 
what Apple is doing, and this is a new thing, this is, has not been yet announced publicly, I got this new last week in Singapore in the ATF, talking with the Apple engineers, is because Apple realized that this is not enough. They need to support 464X LAT for the tethered devices. Because otherwise, you may have a full functional I iPhone, but when you have an all IP4 only device, trying to tether with the, the phone doesn't work. Because Apple can enforce the applications to support IPv6, but not outside the, the telephone. Exactly. So what, what Apple decided, after one year, we have been trying to convince them, hey, what about the tether devices? Finally, they decided they will implement in the next, re next release also the CLAT for the tether devices. For the iPhone, it's not necessary. Instead, Android and Windows, they have been offered, offering CLAT since 2013. Okay? So that's two ways of doing the things. Apple enforcing IPv6, Android saying, well, I don't enforce IPv6, but I give you, by default, the CLAT. So then it works as well. But in both cases, it means the cellular provider can get rid of carrier brain NAT and any IPv4 in his network. Okay? And again, I am mentioning here like cellular network, but the same applies to non cellular network. If you have in this box the transition mechanism, the CLAT support. Okay? So that's, that's the web page where Apple was announcing this. I remember at that time I was in a meeting with a customer. We were doing the, the, the consultancy for, for deploying IPv6 in their network, and as part of the consultancy, we had presentations with different kinds of customers, and one of them was government. The other one was financial sector. And when I asked the, the, the people in the room, hey, you are doing most of your bank business through, through cellular phones today, right? Yes, it's about 80% already. Are your applications ready with IPv6? No, of course not. OK, you know that you have 15 days to update that, or they will get rid of the app store. And I saw several people going out of the room to check with their application developers, hey, are we supporting this? No, we need a solution. In 15 days, they were receiving letters from Apple telling you have now 15 days. I tell you one year in, in advance. You did nothing. So it's a problem. You have seen this all, uh, as well. DNS set considerations. OK. Ouch. Everybody knows what is DNS sec. DNS sec is designed to detect modifications of the DNS responses, right? DNS 64 is faking the response, so it's breaking DNS sec. That's clear. Now, what happens? In NAT64, you mandatorily need the support for DNS64. 464XLAT don't need DNS64. You can deploy 464XLAT without breaking DNS sec. It's true that in cellular networks, and this is something that most of the cellular operators are doing wrong, they are deploying 464XLAT or NAT64, and they are not paying attention to the DNSSEC uh, getting broken. Why? Because they said that the cellular phones don't support DNSSEC, and that's true. But you are doing tethering, and the tethered devices may be using DNSSEC, so you are breaking things. Okay? So there is a, when you, when you build your DNS64 server from unbound or and I have this in mind, that 64 check presentation. Mm -hmm. I, I explain all these things. There is a directive that says break, break DNS. DNS sec. So you need to put that in if you want your DNS 64. Um, um, if there is, if there is um, a, a URL that they deployed DNS sec and they didn't deploy IPv6, that should not happen. If you deploy DNS sec, deploy IPv6. Otherwise, your DNS sec will be broken anyway. Um, 
But if there is some people like this, then if you put this in, break the NSSEC, then, then the DNS64 server will return the, the synthesized quad-A record. It's a little bit of a the problem. The problem is that it's yeah. not so simple li like that. By default, for example, by 9, the DNS break DNSSEC is set to no by default. So you, you do nothing and it's not breaking DNSSEC. But the problem is that if you have in your system a validator instead of using the DNS of the ISP, you are still breaking DNSSEC. Or for example, if you are using Google DNS 8888 instead of your ISP, you are breaking the NSSEC. And we know that today, how many here use Google DNS instead of their own ISP? Almost. By default. So it's breaking. So it's breaking the NSSEC. So it's not so simple. Okay. I have a document, a new document from ITF. I, I wrote it about one month ago explaining all this. It's about six or seven pages only talking about this. So it's not so simple, OK? And there is one more consideration here. Even if you are not having tethered devices, let's suppose you have an iPhone or an Android that the operating system by default don't support DNSSEC. But maybe an application is calling to that because there are libraries to use it. So you are getting that broken. OK? So care with that. And last chance we have, let's use all the transition mechanisms. Well, two problems. First, some of them, like 6RD, require public IP4 addresses. We don't have any more. Second problem, and this is the big one, no other transition mechanism different than 464XLAT has been implemented in any operating system for cellular phones. So you, have, you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. You, you cannot tell Android, give me the light in my phones. No. Simple. It's not possible. Do they, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> now, there is another thing here, is that many of these transition mechanisms require the HCP. Let's talk to our friend Lorenzo from Android to implement the HCP in Android. And he's telling, no, I will never do that. And he's the boss. He's the, really the one deciding if Android will come with the HCP support or not. So there is no way. At least I don't see that. Maybe Lorenzo um, falls tomorrow, break his head, and change his mind. But it's really difficult. Nobody will convince Lorenzo about that. We should get him drunk. <laughs> <laughs> don't work. We, we have tried it already. We have tried it. <laughs> I can tell you we have tried it. Many people have, have tried it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it seems at times, at very few times. <laughs> OK. Uh, last, performance. I mentioned it already. Here you have, OK, this is data from 2015, taken by Facebook in T-Mobile network. OK, T-Mobile is the, one, the first that deployed 464XLAT. In fact, one of the principal engineers in T-Mobile, Cameron Byrne, is one of the co-authors of the 464 XLAT protocol. Uh, so they decided to make some measurements. And they said, let's see how much time it takes for a get HTTP to get completed using IPv4 and using IPv6. And the difference is IPv6 is 30% faster in iPhone. 30% is a lot, OK? It's not just 1%. Android, 40% faster. That was really, really curious to see that. Your what? users will love you. Which one? Your users will love you. Yeah. So what happened, actually, is that at that time, in 2015, 
it looks like the stack in Apple was much more efficient in IPv4 than in IPv6. So what Facebook did is implemented what they call, I am not sure you can read that, mobile provision. Mobile provision is the Facebook own designed IPv6 stack for, an, for iPhone. So when you have in an iPhone the Facebook application, it's actually the application plus a new IPv6 stack to ignore the stack from the operating system. So then they get, again, 40% the same as in Android. 40% improvement in IPv6 traffic versus IPv4 is a lot. These measurements have been done by Facebook, by Akamai, by many other people, and all of them say the same. Definitively, IPv6 today is more efficient. It gives better, how to say, user perceived quality of service, which is at the end what you want. And that means better battery life, which is very important for users. You don't need to have the keep alive as in the NAT for IPv4 and so on. So this is really, 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 really important. This is really good for battery if you don't yeah. send keep alive. Exactly. Your, your, your phone will last longer on IPv6. I didn't hear you. What happens if you keep battery? Then you shouldn't have a phone. <laughs> Comparison between 464X LAT versus carrier green NAT. Many people ask me, why you insist so much if NAT64, in fact, is also carrier green NAT? Yeah, but the cost is much lower for NAT64. It offers much better performance. You can use less addresses with NAT64 than with carrier green NAT because you are optimizing on the fly the usage of the addresses because NAT64 is using not ports allocated to user or pre-allocated, but dynamically is allocating ports to flows. Okay? So you depend on the total of your network instead of what the average user is using. Right? You can deploy this in a progressive way. You can say, OK, let's do that in new phones, then I roll out the rest, whatever. You decide your strategy for deploying this. Uh, you have a lower cost for logging because if you have already native IPv6 traffic, obviously you don't need to have the source ports for all the native IPv6 connections. So definitively that's also a, a, a difference. And then in terms of billing, many people believe that when you deploy IPv6, you need to redo your billing application. Actually not, because you can just trunk uh, in the CDRs, you can trunk the IPv6 addresses to fit in IPv4 addresses, for example, by means of hashing. Okay? So you have ways to do that without actually changing your billing application. Ideally, change it, but if you don't want to do it at the moment, you can do these tricks. Law enforcement authorities. Well, we have already talked a, a little bit about this. If you are having more and more IPv6 traffic, uh, you have much better possibilities to track the right person that is doing that criminal activity instead of trying to do an investigation and wasting human resources, logging resources, and so on. Okay, so that's 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 clear. Roaming, roaming is very important for cellular networks. And this is also supported because there is what we call the policy and charging control function that selectively it will allow to say, hey, I am doing IPv6 already in this country, but I want to make sure that when my user travels with the phone to another country, I have some roaming partners that don't offer yet IPv6. So you can do that selectively. It's, it's really easy. For those that, that here manage cellular networks, you know that you are using that functionality already, probably. And there is one specific document from ITF, which is RFC 7445, which actually explains 
uh, possible uh, scenarios where the roaming can fail with IPv6. So everything is very, very clear because you believe or not, the bigger deployment of IPv6 right now today is clearly in this sector, and it, it's going to be that way. Okay. You know, in, in 2010, in Slovenia, where I come from, we, we deployed IPv6 at three mobile networks. And I was running around with, uh, with a Nokia N900 phone that has IPv6 only connectivity, but not only in Slovenia, also in roaming. So roaming worked, more or less, but the, the failure in roaming was that they, they were not able to charge me. <laughs> I had all the IPv6 traffic for free because when I established the session, IPv6 only session, that's the, that's the PDP v6 uh, uh, session, and um, when I when I uh, shut down the session, the system sent to, to the billing normalization proxy the CDR. That's the the, the, the billing record, so, sort of like how long the session was established and how much traffic I put through and then what was the IP address that I was using. And that was a CDRV6 that had a very long address in there and uh, um, a normalization proxy in, in, in the billing usually said, what is this? Ignore it. Ignore it. <laughs> Go through the bin. So I was running around, around the world for two years <laughs> having, having the internet all around the world completely free because there was no person in the world that was able to charge me. The first, the first, uh, because I know our guys at Telecom, so uh, they they told me, yeah, the first one who were able to send the bill was Telecom Italia <laughs> in 2013 or something like this. They were able, able to reduce the bill. bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody no else was able to send the bill. Yeah. So now today this situation is changed, but. Hey, I had, two, I had two years of free internet around the world, so what's Look, they are, they, are, they are now re re revising all the, the records, so you will get the bill. No, 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 <laughs> this is the bill. <laughs> I don't care. Okay, so very, very, very quickly, overall view of a 3G, 4G architecture for those that don't, don't know that. Uh, basically, we have the, the user equipment, we have the radio area network, we have the, the, the provider service domain. We have the IPv6, in the case of an IPv6 enabled uh, operator uh, ISP part. And then we have the, the connection to IPv4 and IPv6 internet. I am not going to read all the, all the naming, also because they change from different releases of 3G, 4G, LTE, et cetera, et cetera. So just so you have a, a global view. And then, uh, a few details, again, very quickly, so you have a global idea. Uh, well, in, in a cellular network, there are a user plane and a transport plane. Uh, it can run different IP versions, but opt uh, the optimal way is having a single protocol for that, okay? Uh, so there is a way to transport the, the, the user Packets, uh, which is basically a kind of, it's called a PDP uh, context, which is kind of a PPP connection. So you see the, the, the alignment with, with other networks that are non cellular. Um, the packets travel in the network tunnelet, okay? That's the way uh, it works. And what happens is that you can have either one PDP context uh, can be IPv4 only, or it can be IPv6 only, or it can be dual stack. The name of each one is IPv4, IPv6, IPv4v6. That's the name of this PDP context type thing, okay? You could also provide dual stack by means of two PDP contexts, one for IPv4 and one for IPv6. And the interesting thing when using 464XLAT is that instead of having different kind of PDP contexts, because the access is IPv6 only, it means you only need to use the 
IPv6 only PDP context. So again, this is looking into the long-term strategy that I mentioned at the beginning, okay? So the idea is I can still provide IPv4 service. In fact, IPv4 as a service on top of an IPv6 only PDP context because my access is IPv6 only. There is another important quest, uh, concept here in cellular networks, and this is something that everybody has seen, is the APN. The APN is a logical name for one of the devices that the operator in the cellular network has, which is the GGSN, okay? Uh, basically, the APN, uh, APN is a fully qualified name. Uh, well, and it explains how it works. I am not going to enter into the details. But here is the important thing. In most of the transition mechanisms, you need to set up one APN for every kind of device. If you have IPv4 devices, you set up one APN for IPv4 devices. If you have IPv6 devices, one APN for IPv6. If you have dual stack, one APN for dual stack devices. With 464XLAT, if you do it correctly, you can avoid that and you can have a single APN for all your network, okay? Which, of course, it makes much simple the deployment of any kind of device. So a single APN, what it's doing is supporting both dual stack and single stack, but with a single APN. Uh, basically, what we have here is a network that is self-adapting to what the user has in his hand. Instead of having a network ready for every kind of device, you have a network that self-adapts to what I have in my hand, okay? which obviously is quite convenient. It's quite convenient in other aspects because it also allows that you deploy IPv6 at your convenience in the sense that maybe I am going to do a trial Let's set up this kind of device for the trial. And only the new customers that have the Samsung Galaxy 12, for example, will have at the moment IPv6 support. And when I am sure that it works, I can do what they call OTA, which is over the air updates to select all the, the other devices or to enable all the other devices. OK? There is a very important functionality, which is the uh, discovery of the prefix being used for the address synthesis, and this is explained also in RFC 7050. Okay, so these are key documents if you are going to deploy something like 464XLAT to read. It's, it's uh, very, very key documents. Now, how we do the address allocation in cellular networks? In cellular networks, we have a stateless Slack which by default provides a slash 64 for every PDP context. We have a stateful DHCPv6, but as we mentioned already before, nobody is supporting DHCPv6 in cellular phones today, so it's meaningless. And then there is a specific GPRS-based mechanism that I am not going to, to detail. If you have seen already this diagram for a Slack in a non-cellular network, in a local area network, you put one next to the other and basically don't see difference, okay? So through all these details that I explained about the PDP context, APN, and so on, it makes it transparent. So you just have to know how Slack works in a regular network to understand how it works in a cellular network. In the case of tethering, there is an interesting thing. What happens is when a device is enabled for tethering, what it's doing is the slash 64 that it's getting is extending it to the rest of the devices that are tethered by that device, okay? But that smartphone. So in that sense, the user equipment, the smartphone, gets switched from being an IPv6 host to being both a router and a host. That's the way it works, the tethering. Remember when I 
what I explained before about Apple. What happens right now with Apple? If you do tethering and you have IPv4 devices, the applications in the iPhone don't need IPv4, so don't need CLAT because they already mandated support for IPv6. But what they need to do is to deliver an additional PDP context, which costs money. It costs an extra license to the, to, the, to the cellular provider for the tethering. Once Apple deploy the CLAT in the tethering, then that's done. OK? So that's the perfect situation. You have applications mandating IPv6 support, but using the same PDP context, you can provide the tethering to IPv4 only devices. Let me skip the dynamic address allocation. There is nothing new and explain this, this thing. A few years ago, actually in 2006, I, write an, uh, I wrote a, a, an internet draft explaining that if you give to a user a slash 48, for the point-to-point -point link, you can use the first slash 64. At that time, I was told, hey, you don't need to tell with so many details what the vendors need to do and so on. And what happened is that in 2012, the 3GPP standards write, wrote uh, an RFC which basically says prefix exclude options. So you use the HCPV6 to allocate a slash 48 to a customer, but you tell to the CPE, don't use the first one because it's the one link. And this is exactly what is being done in the 3G networks, OK? Uh, so if you deploy IPv6 in a cellular network this way, you will declare success because you will see very, very quickly how all the traffic is moving from IPv4 to IPv6. And I have some graphics to demonstrate that. And the most important thing, customers will not notice that you change it, their IPv4 only link to an IPv6 only link because everything worked the same. And this graphic provided by ISOC, by Mat Mat4, is showing that in, I don't see without glasses, I think it's August. Yes, August this year, the last figure, there was already 70% of traffic IPv6 in the four big US networks. T-Mobile, Sprint, Verizon, AT&T. All together have already 70%, well, four months ago, they have already 70% of IPv6 traffic, which clearly shows that IPv6 is there, right? It's not just 5%, 5 10%, it's 70%. It's growing more or less, according to what I have been looking in the last years, it's growing more or less 3% per month, typically, between 2 and 3% per month in those networks. Not globally, but in those networks. Globally, I think Google is measuring about 23% right now in the world. Okay? Now, as I insisted at the beginning, most of the presentation looks like cellular network, but all what I said applies also to the residential or even corporate networks. And at this way, you have both kind of networks. You don't need to have different transition mechanisms. Or even worse, if you, I think I mentioned it before. If you want to have a CPE which GPON and a backup with 3G, there is no other way than having, well, there are ways. but so complex that don't make sense. Instead, if you have a single transition mechanism, you switch from one end or the other, and, and it's done, right? So that's, I think that's almost the last slides. In RIPE, uh, just a, a month ago, yeah, one month ago in RIPE in Dubai, I, I set up this, this demo, which was the one I was trying to do today here, but it was not possible, and we had this, this uh, working, and basically that's the, the structure of the, of the setup that I did, right? And it was done with one of these $10 boxes. Nothing else, nothing special. So just Linux, and that's it. 
And if you are interested, this is the last slide, some of the work that I am doing related to all this uh, in ITF is some, some of the pointers to, to those documents. And that's it. I'm not sure how we went with the time. 10 minutes late, maybe. It's not too bad. Questions? If you have questions which are not related to this, I am happy also, as well. I mean, anything related to IPv6, I will find the answer. Here, somewhere, there, there should be an answer. If not, Jan, help me. <laughs> When going to dual stack, yeah. you mean real, real dual stack, IPv4 and IPv6. Yeah. And you are talking about public IPv4 addresses? Yes. Of course, that's the bigger problem. But not only, because it means also you are managing two networks, which is also an extra cost. Okay, yes, I understand, but uh, you are considering different... Uh, you are an ISP, I guess. So, yeah. Which... If you want to say, I, I guess this country is not too big, so everybody knows about everybody, right? But if you want to say, how many customers and which access types you have, more or less? Just an idea. Mostly wireless. Mostly wireless. So you are a wireless ISP, I guess. Uh, Non-cellular. Wireless like yes. wireless. OK. More or less, how many customers? If you want to say, or you don't want to say. OK. I, I can tell you something. Uh, about one year ago, in, in some parts of Spain, there are a lot of ISPs, which some of them are very small, 500 customers. Others are bigger, like 10,000 customers, um, which basically use uh, Mikrotik and Ubiquiti. OK? I guess you are in a similar situation. And uh, these, those ISPs are working together in a wireless ISP association. So they hire me to do a training and consultancy for their networks. So instead of having one training for each one, they put them together, all them in a single room for one week, and we did all the training and all the stuff. So it, it, it gets cheaper for all, right? Uh, we have been talking with Microtik since then, to ask them to support better transition mechanisms. Because the only transition mechanism supported by Mikrotik is what they call 6 to 4, which is not 6 to 4, it's 6 in 4. So they are so bad that even the naming is wrong. OK? They never provided any answer. Even talking, strike, which one of the top engineers, we are still waiting the answer. If you look into the Mikrotik forums, you will see my name blaming them for all this. You know what happened to my customers? They are doing IPv6. They are using 464 uh, xlat You know what they did? It's sad, but they flushed the Mikrotik devices which opened WRT. It's very sad, but it's a solution, right? The, the hardware is good. I mean, it's, it's cheap, it's convenient, it's true that Mikrotik operating system has some good things for wireless, but hey, what is more important for you, the continuity of your business or having ni nice wireless features if you really are having your business in risk? So, okay, I have a question for you. Do you still have enough IPv4 addresses? Uh, Obviously not. Yeah. I don't believe that. <laughs> okay, so you buy them. You buy some now. No, 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 they're using net. OK, so why you don't just deploy IPv6 in parallel and run, run both, both stacks that's at the same time? That's, that's what they are trying to decide. At the same time, and, at the same time and then um, gather, gather the experience with IPv6. Because if you switch to something else, currently you have no experience with it. You need a year or two or three of getting in trouble and, and, and learn how to troubleshoot these problems build your security policies so it could work. Because if you have, if, 
if you're using net already, it cannot get worse. Right? So with, with, deploying, with deploying IPv6 in parallel and running both, both stacks, it, it just can get better. Right? So you, 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 you divert half of the traffic basically to IPv6 immediately. And if you, if you break IPv6 due to your inexperience with IPv6, IPv4 and the happy eyeballs will, will save your back or your ass or how well. <laughs> yeah. So the internet connectivity will still work, but you will start gaining experience with IPv6. And then when you are comfortable enough with IPv6 and, and you see that, that, that it's not a big thing and it's not a uh, rocket science, then at that point in time you start deciding what to do with IPv4. But what you will see is that less and less traffic will go to your translation to NAT, and more and more traffic will go over IPv6. So at one, some point in time, you maybe decide, okay, now it's time to, to replace NAT64, uh, NAT44 with NAT64 maybe, and stop providing IPv4 to customers and try and start translating. But please do this in sort of like controlled manner. Don't, don't do anything crazy because you don't have experience with it. Learn experience and let the protocol sort it out for you and, and cover your back. T totally agree. In fact, this is my advice when I am sure that my customers have enough addresses for keeping dual stack. But enough addresses means not just for today, but also for the next year or something like that. OK? Otherwise, you need to rush. What it don't make sense is if you have addresses only for two months, deploy now dual stack. That don't make sense. Now, if you expect X growing in, in your network and you know that you have IP4 addresses, then it's time to get experience and uh, at the same time start doing some experiments with 464X LAT or whatever. But, but yeah, I agree. Hopefully, in that time, Mikrotik is deploying, is providing 464x LAT. <coughs> Hopefully. From your initial plan, it felt that we came uh, like to the step number seven. Okay. This is the best plan, and uh, it took more than a, a couple of weeks. But uh, now I get to move on. And if you want to say, are you allocating what addressing a space to your customers? Yes. Uh, we were uh, we chose slash fifty six for normal customers and forty eight for business. I will suggest you should recons reconsider that. Yeah. Let me explain something. This is this is not the topic of this presentation, but it's very very short. There is a protocol in an, in a, in ITF which is getting into these small boxes in maybe maximum two years. I don't think it take more. In fact, I have been committed last week in Singapore to write the document for that. Uh, this work is called HomeNet. HomeNet is a way for a CPE, and this means a CPE in a home, Soho, a small business, or even big business, to automatically you have this box provided by the ISP, and because we, you, we are getting more need for wireless, what you do in IPv4 is this is an ad box, and you put another box, another box, another box, and you cascade three or four levels of NAT boxes. In IPv4, that more or less works, but in IPv6, not. So HomeNet is defining a protocol, so this box, which is the primary one, can provide a prefix to the next box, to the next box, to the next box. And that prefix is a slash 56. If this box has a slash 56, 56, how come it's going to provide a slash 56 to the others? You see the point? So I would recommend now that you have not yet started, you still have time to redesign that. One of the things that we comment in the document that, that we mentioned before, the RIPE 690, it was? 690? Six, six ninety. Of it. Come yeah, on. but I don't remember the numbers. I am very bad with numbers. <laughs> I have enough remembering IPv6 addresses. Oh, yeah. uh, the thing is, in this document, 
uh, we also mentioned that using the prefix size as a differentiator for different business classes don't make sense. It looks like very fancy, but it's not really a good idea. And for you managing uh, only a network which everything is slash 48 is easier than some is slash 56, some is slash 48. Yes, we are just used to uh, the way of thinking of IPv4. That's it. That's it. Forget about it. That's it. it. Yeah, yeah. That's Forget it. everything from IPv4. That's it. It doesn't exist. It's a new protocol. Think of it like Banyan Vines. How much you know about Banyan Vines? Have you ever heard about Banyan Vines protocol? It's a very old protocol. <laughs> you probably know nothing about Banyan Vines. Or IPX. Or, 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 or DECnet. <laughs> DECnet. You know anything about DECnet? Apple Talk. <laughs> okay, IPv6 is like DECnet. You need to learn everything from the very start. Would you, would you apply your bad habits from IPv4 to DECnet? Probably not. Just because it's called IP doesn't mean it's the same protocol. Think about it like this. We, we make a mistake. We, we should never call it, uh, have called it IP. Maybe it, it was a bad, bad idea. Ben and <laughs> but yeah, definitively, that's, that's, that's the thing. Uh, if you have addresses, then feel free. Use them. Uh, but take in consideration that it's not a single step then. So you have the decision to do it in one step or do it in two. I agree that if you have Mikrotik and you want to use their, feature, their features, then you cannot reflash the boxes. And by the way, not all the boxes of Mikrotik have support for OpenWrt. Most of them, but not all of them. It depends on, on what, what products you have in your customers. More questions? Definitely. For s look, uh, if you if you look at, at uh, the la the latest two three years deployments of uh, IPv6 in the server world, 99% uh, are using 464x LAT. There there must be a, a reason for that. If you have a single APN, which a single APN, you can use that APN in order to have also an IPv4 only PDP context type. So the, depending on what, what happens is that the device is telling the network what he needs. Done. Android devices since 2013 will ask yeah, exactly. So today, most of the Android and most of the iPhones will ask for IPv6 only. And only very, very old devices or devices that, for whatever reason, the user didn't update it will keep using IPv4. Yeah, but the support Yeah, the net could support it. Oh, oh, yeah, OK. I was understanding in the other side. Yeah, exactly, exactly. What you are not forced is to have multiple APNs for every kind of device. That's a mess. That doesn't make sense. More questions? Exam? Go to the exam. I can tell you, I don't know if, if I put that in the slides, but I can tell you that in the last years, there have been deployments of 464x LAT in uh, Orange, Poland. Now is doing Orange in France, Orange Spain, Telstra, uh, SK Telecom, which is South Korea Telecom. Uh, of course, the four big players in US. And right now, I am doing a deployment in Guatemala for 12 million cellular phones, which is not a small one. So that's it. Thank you very much.